Good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are turned to silent. We have received apologies today from Tavis Scott, MSP. Um, we are joined at the committee today by Sandra White, uh, MSP, and I shall bring her in uh, later. Um, our first item of business today is an evidence session on the Glasgow School of Art. Uh, this is the committee's first evidence session on the Art School, and I would like to place on record that we will be taking uh, a further evidence session on this particular topic. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Eileen Reid, the former Head of Widening Participation at Glasgow School of Art, uh, Malcolm Fraser, an architect, Roger Billcliffe, uh, the director of the Roger Billcliffe Gallery and Ch a Charles Rennie Macintosh Scholar and Stuart Robertson, the director of the Charles Rennie Macintosh Society. Uh, we're all here uh, because Scotland has lost a masterpiece of global importance uh, and many agree that the Macintosh building was the most significant piece of architecture, uh, indeed the most significant piece of art that's ever been produced uh, in Scotland. After the 2014 fire which destroyed part of the building, uh, the investigation by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service uh, was clear about the, the causes of the fire and the reason for its rapid acceleration. And there was enormous sympathy and an understandable determination uh, to move on and rebuild. But now the building has been completely destroyed uh, in a second fire and many people, uh, not just in Glasgow but around the world, uh, want to know why. I know that uh, some of the experts in our panel today have raised those questions. Uh, media reports at the weekend in advance of this committee meeting have tried to focus again on the debate around rebuilding, and I'm sure members will have questions on that subject. Uh, but before we do that, can I ask uh, the members of the panel if you think lessons were learned uh, from the first fire? If not, why not? And if, in your view, there was a systemic failure of risk assessment on the part of the custodians of the Glasgow School of Art Macintosh building? Uh, perhaps we could start with Roger Billcliffe. Well, we don't know if any lessons were learned because the school has not said a word about the 2014 fire. The, the Scottish Fire Service report, which was published, is redacted, and it tells you what happened, but it doesn't tell you, but they must know, why it happened and who was responsible for it. And the school has refused to comment about the fire other than saying that the initial uh, spark uh, uh, caused by a student using a banned substance within the school was an accident. So we don't know whether they have learned anything. We don't know whether they have proceeded to protect the, the, the vent that caused the fire to spread. We're talking about a fire that was just put out within three minutes of the fire brigade arriving. But by the time they arrived, it had already gone up to the top floor because um, from the basement, up a, a chimney, effectively a chimney, but Macintosh designed it as a ventilation shaft. And modern ventilation shafts are blocked off at each floor automatically when a fire occurs to stop fire spreading. The school had spent eight and a half million pounds of HLF money between 2008 and 2012 to make the building, in the words of its then director, fit for the 21st century. By not protecting those vents, it was by no means fit for the 21st century. It was a fire trap waiting to happen. And the luckiest thing that happened in that fire is that nobody died. If they had died and there'd been a fatal accident inquiry, we would have had answers to the questions ab about why the school wasn't protected. Um, there could have been a public inquiry which would also have answered those questions. The school promised the Macintosh Society to see that we would see the results of an internal inquiry. We don't know whether that inquiry ever happened because we've never seen anything. So whether lessons have been learned, nobody knows. Thank you. Uh, Eileen Reid, uh, you worked at the school um, uh, from 2000. Um, do you know if an internal inquiry took place after the 2014 fire? There are two... A lot of rumours are circulating, which is part of the problem here, that they were, we're relying on hearsay and, um, and rumours. And the two major ones concerning an inquiry are this. One that on the Saturday morning following the 2014 fire, 
um, a senior member of staff was tasked to um, investigate the causes of the fire and photograph the building with the chief fire officer um, um, in North Glasgow and that a report was written and that it was suppressed. I don't think that's that's one version. I don't think it's a correct one. I think the correct version is that um, the the task was to organise the decant very quickly of the Macintosh building um, and in doing that to photograph and to to go around the rest of the building um, not not obviously not the part that was burnt or that was photographed too. And what seems to have emerged from that is that there were multiple failures of health and safety um, in the, the MAC building in the run-up to that particular um, um, degree show. And not a report, but a list of um, concerns um, and findings were handed to the director at the time, um, Tom Inns. I think, in my own view, is that what's gone wrong here is that, at the very least, when that emergency committee was set up on the Saturday morning, that there should have been an immediate investigation, um, an internal investigation. I don't mean a disciplinary one, where, you know, maybe that has or has not happened about about the cause uh, source of ignition, but a systemic investigation into, as Roger said, how we've ended up in a situation where the most vulnerable, um, apparently it's the top of the list for the fire, um, fire service in Glasgow, as the most um, risk at-risk building of fire in Glasgow, possibly Scotland, and how we've ended up in a situation um, where where the risk, quite obviously, um, wasn't calculated properly about the protection of the building. And I think if an investigation had taken place, then perhaps it was the only way. I don't know how lessons can be learned unless there's an investigation into the causes of the, tw of the 2014 fire. Talking about an investigation into the managerial processes yes, around health and safety, systemic. as opposed to what the fire service did. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the fire service, I mean, quite rightly, the, the, their main focus is, is on the point of, of ignition and cause. I mean, they're not for apportioning, you know, responsibility particularly. Um, I mean, you know, in the art school, anyone who works in there, anyone, and I would defy anyone to, to say otherwise, anybody who works in there knew that building was a risk. We all knew it. Um, we, we used to talk about how many minutes we would have to get out um, because it was so, you know, it was precarious given the hundred years of, 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 um, um, of, not abuse, but the way the building is used, um, flammable materials and the rest. And um, we all knew it. And, you know, our main protection was the fire the fire alarm and the smoke alarm and um and it went off you know felt frequently but probably wasn't i set it off myself once um and you know if you were at the top of that building when that fire alarm went off you moved you know and that was before we didn't need reports we didn't need risk assessments we didn't even know then that the baffles or the ventilation ducts weren't closed off but we knew that was a very risky, um, um, hazardous building. Um, of course, I'm concerned with the iconic building, but it was a threat to life too. Thank you very much. Stuart Robertson, would you like to come in? Uh, well, I think they've covered a lot. I think, again, there's elements that, uh, again, after the 2014 fire, I think uh, the, the, the loss of what, on the Macintosh side was very much underplayed at the time and uh, the school was predominantly focusing on the degree show and the students so actually Macintosh was very much underplayed and the level of what was lost in the first fire uh, wasn't really put out to the public domain very easily and even today it's very hard to, uh, to analyse through the, the website what was actually lost. I think it was over 150 
original pieces of Macintosh furniture plus his two original oil uh, paintings. I think there's elements there about the original fire. We know how it was caused. Again, there's discussions about the supervision of the art school and how all these inflammable materials were allowed to be brought in to the school, which, again, as Roger said, we've not been privy to an investigation in the report. So it's very hard for us to, to add to that. OK. Malcolm Fraser, from an architect's point of view, um, in, in terms of the response to the first fire, um, do you think um, it was the correct response and how would you have thought that the art school management should have gone about? Well, I think um, lessons had been learned. I, I actually also have the benefit of my, my daughter was studying at the GSA and in fact graduated the day of the fire. We'd been at our graduation and we're leaving when we got a text from her that there was a glow on the horizon, a really horrific text. Um, I think we need to wait until the report from the Fire and Rescue Service to actually understand what's gone wrong this time. I think there is some issues of statutory oversight which we need to look at in more detail um, and better statutory oversight because this happens to too many historic buildings. It's just one of a number recently and we need to make sure that the lessons we draw from these Macintosh disasters aren't just about the Mac building itself but can apply to all historic buildings in Scotland which we need to take more care of. We don't. Uh, and indeed, I think, for me, the cause of the first fire um, was uh, treating the Macintosh as an icon to be monetized without taking good care of it itself uh, and uh, creating an empire around it without taking care of the jewel of the heart of it. I think the second one, the causes are more failures in statutory oversight, and I really hope that the uh, investigation tells us how we need to tighten those up to make sure that we do take care of buildings on site. A building in Glasgow that was lost, Littlewoods in Liverpool, um, around about the same time are more examples of that. So um, a, a, a plea to look wider and look to improve the lot for all historic buildings, as well as taking care of the future of the, the Macintosh building. Uh, you, you've said... Um publicly that a certain type of insulation uh, was used, um, which was flammable. Um, but in Glasgow School of Arts um, document that they released on what we know this summer, they said that they abided by all the statutory regulations, both from Glasgow City Council and Historic Scotland, and I think Historic England was mentioned as well. The, this material is legal. Um, it was uh, used in Grenfell. Um, I'm distressed it was used in the Macintosh, but I have looked in great oh. detail... Sorry? Do we know for sure it was used? Uh, all reports, they have not confirmed, but all reports were that it had gone in. There's reports from the site that it had gone in. Um, I don't, having looked in great detail at this, because this is an extremely sensitive point, I don't believe the material is flammable. I've seen tests on it where it just doesn't go on fire, no matter how many blow torches you put on it. So I would not raise that as being a contributory factor to the fire. So once again, I would want the investigation to confirm that. Okay, thank you very much. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. The comments we've heard um, this morning suggest that there's, uh, as Malcolm suggested, there's been a level of exploitation of the legacy of Macintosh, that there's maybe not been the recognition of the cultural significance of the building and then the due care that would go along with maintaining that. I was interested in some of the comments from... Um, the submission we got from Malcolm Fraser around the 2014 fire and the insurance. Um, and you suggest that the insurance payout... Th th what I'm interested in is the fundraising that went around it. There was an insurance payout. At the same time, there was a big degree of fundraising. And I think um, you're saying the fundraising was for additional work. Would that be a standard? Because you've, you've described other buildings, historic buildings, that have been vulnerable to this kind of risk. Would that be the standard insurance arrangements? Well, insurance and, and both uh, fires were different because one was an existing building and one was during work. During work, the, the, what's happened now, there is a standard insurance clause which is taken out and the uh, school has confirmed that it was in place which pays for the rebuild of what is lost during a fire, during construction. That's absolutely standard industry practice. I understand that's in place. So I regretted um, people saying 
why should we spend all this money when we've got a, a, a housing crisis, etc.? Which is an understandable thing to say, but it's not government, us, paying the money. Insurance should pay out to put the building back as it was, and that should just put a lid on that question entirely. Sorry to interrupt. At the weekend, I'm not disputing um, what you're saying, but at the weekend, I thought Glasgow Art College said they think the insurance would cover it, but they would also be looking for charitable and other kind of inputs to the fun overall funding package. They seem to suggest the insurance would be enough for an overall funding package, so they made clear they weren't looking for public money to fill any gaps. Well, I can't speak for them, but I can't say why they should be doing that. After the original fire, as I understood it, they raised money to look for betterment, to pay for better insulation, fire alarms, etc., etc., and uh, um, endowments and more space and things like that. They used that as a vehicle to improve the general lot of the estate, and that was what the fundraising was for. But uh, I would... I was, going to, I was going to ask if everybody thinks it was clear that's no, what the fundraising there was also was aspects for. And also that you mentioned other materials that were lost in that original fire. That yeah, but I think there was also... The, the school had uh, meetings with Windsor Castle and York Minster to discuss how they dealt with their fires. And one of the things that came out of it was to do a forensics of, of the art school before doing any clear-up. Uh, and again, that's money. That costs money as well. So that's that be outside the insurance cost. So there was elements like that. It was one example of additional cost. Again, as I said, there was, I think, I'm not sure what the value is, it's something like £4 million of, of Macintosh uh, furniture and items were lost in the fire, you know. And we aren't, so did can, you I, can I, I say that, that, I mean, the cause, the reason the fire spread in the first place was because this one ventilation shaft was not protected. There were another dozen of them throughout the school. So obviously, um, insurers are not going to pay for the for, for the protection in those uh, ventilation shafts. That would be extra to any any money that the insurers paid to reinstate the parts of the building that were damaged. So the school rightly, well, it couldn't do anything else, decided that it would have to look at those shafts. We don't know what they did. As far as the, 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 the insulation is concerned, there, there was a paper produced, or published, I think, by the Architects' Journal, which was written by the chief conservation architect of Page Park, where he itemises and actually specifies the insulation that was used, which, um, as, as Malcolm says, was the same that was used at Grenfell. I'm going to ask, sorry, this is just a, a, a question. The Charles Rennie Macintosh Society, um, what relationship do you, or traditionally, have had with the Glasgow Art College when it comes to the importance of that building? And have you been involved in any, the ongoing, prior to the fires, did you have any involvement in discussions around maintain, maintenance of no, that I building or protection of that building? Or I think that's an area where we would like to be more involved. I think... Um, the, the society has been very supportive. The society has got an advocacy role of all of Macintosh. And a couple of years ago, we did building surveys of all of Macintosh's collection, which was funded through the Monument Trust. And that was 50 buildings, including monuments, to give us a gauge of what the condition of all these buildings are. So the society has had a, an ongoing programme of uh, very much looking after Macintosh and the collection and promoting it worldwide. We, we would have liked to have been more involved in the last four years of the project. Uh, I've found it very difficult to get access to the building over that period of time. I can maybe count in one hand how many times I got access to the building. I've had some discussions uh, more recently since the last fire uh, from uh, one of the architects from Page and Park and staff member at School of Art saying they wished that myself and the society were more involved in the project. Okay. Okay. Annabelle Ewing. Hey. Good morning. Um, yeah, I, I, want, I have two questions. I want to start with um, picking up on some of the comments made. You know, obviously, so 2014, there's a catastrophic failure, uh, okay? And uh, to what extent then, you know, if you were to take, you know, the example of some other organisation and there's a catastrophic failure, you know, what that organisation would have to do would be to go back to, to basics, go through all its processes, its policies, uh, see what it could do differently, if it could do something differently. And that is, that is what you would anticipate in normal circumstances to happen in a large organisation. Uh, can I perhaps ask Eileen, um, to what extent did any of that happen? What was the kind of culture operating post the first catastrophic fire in 2014? 
Well, I left the institution in November 2014. Um, um, I do, so I'm not, you know, since then, I'm, I, I'm not sure. It seems that nothing much was done at all. Um, and I have talked to lots of current colleagues and, and ex-colleagues. Um, the systemic failure, the, the, I mean, any institution of that size, I mean, it has to manage risk. I mean, the, you know, you, you, we can't have unavoidable risks. But the culture at GSE in, in relation to the building was one of managed risk. We lived with it. It survived till now. There's a sort of attitude, well, it hasn't happened for 100 years. Why would it happen now? Which is a kind of logical fallacy, actually, but, you know, n n not really very good for, for um, um, a factor in risk assessment. But, you know, decisions on investment, health and safety really had to be taken in the wider context um, of significant pressure on, on HEI, um, on, on, on their budget. And they're a small specialist institution. Um, they've got economies of scale. Um, they've got huge challenges. Um, and I think they approached risk... risk um, in a way that that was looser than it should have been. I mean, for example, there was one health and safety office, officer for the entire school, not just the, the entire school. Um, there was no dedicated fire officer for the school. The health and safety officer for years prior to the 2014 fire was, was warning repeatedly, um, as, as was the Macintosh curator, that, that there were significant risks. Um, things like um, the boards that were used to sort of cover up the, the, the ventilation shafts. Um, you know, contractors would come in and remove them and not put them back, and the electrical conduits that would, that, that would go up into the shaft. And this is maybe not a record in any formal report or inquiry, but apparently it is um, recorded in the um, Health and Safety Committee minutes. So I think it worked up until 2014, but it failed. And I don't think there's any particular individual at fault at all here. I do think it's systemic, and I do think it's a misjudged um, attitude towards risk for such a hazardous building and such a high iconic building. And, you know, for me, for the lives of the people who... who, who. So it's small. It, you know, they're individual senior managers with huge remits, and I think this has to be factored into um, how they managed the building and, and the school in general, um, not to mention sort of resources. But what I don't understand, and you've just made the point, why they didn't immediately conduct a thorough and rigorous investigation, I don't know. Malcolm? They were doing what our university culture asks of our institutions. They were increasing the estate. They were bringing more students in. They were building big, flashy new buildings, getting them named after themselves, and not looking after the jewel at the heart of their estate. That's a, that's a primary failure. And it's not just Glasgow School of Art, but many institutions do the same, fail to care for the, the jewel at the heart of themselves. I, I know that other colleagues, I think, are going to get on to, you know, the, the looking to the future in terms of, uh, you know, is there an inherent, uh, you know, un, uh, unresolved unres conflict as between somebody like GSA, you know, operating their business, if you like, and being the protector of this World Heritage site. But can I ask Malcolm, because it's something that's puzzled me, but at the, the time of the, the fire, the GSA issued a statement to say, um, at the time of the, the, the fire, the Macintosh building was not part of the GSA's operational estate and this was in the management fire. and control of Care Construction yeah. Scotland Limited. What does that actually mean? Because presumably the GSA remained owner of the, the site uh, and therefore they were the, the principal, the contractors were the agents. Would then you expect there to be no oversight function at all, nothing to do, it's nothing to do with me, I'm the owner, but I have absolutely nothing to do with this building? Is that how that's, it would normally the, work? The legal process is that a site is handed over to its main contractor, 
the main contractor, in order to carry out their obligations and looking after the site, has to have that ownership transferred to them for the currency of the contract. That is standard practice. And there's no, then, no subsequent um, communication as between owner and contractor? Yes. There's just there's, nothing that happens? There, there's, there's communication, yes. Mm. Uh, the GSA should put in place structures around the contract which requires the main contractor, Cure Construction, to look after construction design management, health and safety, procure the contract properly, employment practices, all those sorts of things. So these structures are in place, and I would like to talk about the adequacy of the, these structures and the statutory oversight that goes with them, because I think that's what's been missing. Um, so I have heard nothing that have said that the proper processes weren't put in place in terms of project management, in terms of construction management, uh, in terms of what was required of care construction. Though, you know, I hope that the Fire and Rescue Service are working with the Building Standards Department and other agencies to ensure to have oversight of the contracts. We don't just want to guddle about in the evidence and, and, and look at the building and work out how it started. We need to know why materials were stored in the wrong place or why compartmentalisation of the building was not in place or why the people who here have said were there and trained to inspect the building 24-7 for fire weren't there. Where were they? Um, what, were the, uh, train, what was the training they went through? What was the, the system that ensured that they did tick? Uh, that said they had inspected the building. What was that oversight and where did it go wrong? Because clearly it did. Well, that's very interesting. And I suppose we also need to know, because I'm assuming from what you've said, that you are not um, absolutely directly aware or otherwise of what exactly was in place as between the GSA board and CARE. We don't know that either. So that would be a key part of the, the jigsaw I think you're referring to as well. We hear about the investigation. I would like to hear... Uh, uh, about the detail of the investigation and that it is going to look at contractual arrangements, uh, uh, building control, building standards and construction design management regulations and how they were applied in this case because these are the critical places where something has clearly, several things have clearly gone wrong. Thank you. As a supplementary to that, the construction design management regulations that you mentioned, I believe they were brought in in 2015 as health and safety regulations, and they, they, they're quite demanding, aren't they? They, they? they expect the contract to cover the very wide possibilities of risk and take into account past history and the historic nature of the building. Is that, is that correct? Uh, they weren't brought in, but they were changed and updated at right. that time. They've been brought in gradually. Um, there should have been uh, a fire risk assessment uh, uh, as part of the construction design management process um, and as I'm alluding to, I would like, I, I think the investigation absolutely needs to look at the adequacy of that. And if it's not adequate, why was it allowed through as being not adequate? What needs to be tightened up there? Because some, some fire experts have, uh, have questioned why there wasn't a temporary sprinkler system in. We know that there was a sprinkler system about to be installed, yeah. but it, uh, it's apparently good practice in certain circumstances to install a temporary sprinkler system. Perhaps, but sometimes you find it's the sprinkler system industry saying that. Um, th I don't necessarily think that out of this will come the need for every building site to have a sprinkler system during the currency of the works. That might make life very difficult. Um, so I, I, I would hope there would be talk of that, whether it would have made a difference, whether it was feasible, etc. Thank you very much. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. Can I just touch on the, the, the role of the, the Board of Governors uh, at the school? I mean, they, they are the sort of senior role within this whole process. Their uh, sort of raison d'etre was to look at the effective management of the school, the vision of the school, the investment, and they were responsible for risk assessment. So can I ask you, how competent do you believe they are, have been prior to the first fire and before the second? They haven't had a great deal to say, um, and the, the Muriel Gray's comment last over the weekend was the first substantive comment since 2014. Um, but the board has changed considerably, and it's changed along with the school's attitude to Macintosh. Uh, up until 20 years ago, the administration 
was very much aware of Macintosh and very much aware of the importance of the building, not just to the, their teaching, but to the, to the wider... Um, most of the directors of the School of Arts since the war had been taught in the Macintosh building or had other connections. That stopped around 2000, and, and, and that an administration was built which... Um, was not dependent on people who had been trained in the school and knew specifically about the building. And there was only one curator uh, f uh, of the Macintosh collection who had been there for 20, 30 years, so he, he was a good source. And the composition of the Board of Governors seems to have changed as well. I mean, if you look at it now, it, it seems to be full of academics from other institutions, uh, retired civil servants, uh, a couple of businessmen. Go back to 1900 when the school was built. It was primarily a board of local businessmen who found the money to build the school. The money did not come from the Scottish Education Department. Uh, these people, the board, excuse me, the board found the money. So the board is totally different. And you might say that, well, the, the school is totally different. In 1900, Glasgow School of Art had one building the Macintosh building. Now it's got 15. Um, and only 20% of, of the student population ever visit the Macintosh building. I know students who are now practicing architects, jewelers, whatever, who said that in their time at the art school, they never went through the building. Uh, so there are all sorts of changes, and the board has changed in the same way. And it's a board which reflects changes in administration in higher education and in the growth of the school but it doesn't in any way reflect that they have a jewel at the heart of the, the, their estate mm -hmm. my, uh, once again I mentioned my daughter uh, um, it being particularly useful experience she had been told that the intention before the, this year's fire she'd been told the intention was to move all first years into the building after the rebuild to be taught together so everyone could experience uh, the Macintosh building, which she thought and I thought was a really, really good idea. Um, the glory of the building is that it's such a great teaching environment, such a great learning environment. Um, we have plenty of uh, Macintosh behind the glass with do not touch, signs in it, etc. This is a this is and was and should be again a working building for students and the uh, richness of education that uh, Scottish students have had in there is reflected in the output of Scottish artists, Scottish architects. We need to return to that. And I would like the Glasgow School of Art to be talking about what they would want to do with that building again when they get it back and what students go in it and I would like them to reconsider this idea of putting all first years in, in it because I think that's a really positive, that would be a really positive thing to put forward. The, the whole leadership of the organisations is crucial and, and you've, you've given examples there of what they were planning to do and how that was progressing. And I think that, that sounds reasonable about what they were trying to achieve uh, to ensure that there was that opportunity. Uh, but you know, but the, the fitness for purpose and ensuring that the governance and scrutiny was in place, uh, I, I get the feeling that that still was a big issue uh, for the school, uh, for the management, and probably for the students as to how that was coordinated to ensure that, that this building was given its, its opportunity to feature as it should. Uh, and it was put at risk, and it was continually put at risk, uh, it would appear, uh, even after uh, the first fire. Uh, so, that, so lessons had not been learned. So as I say, I have a real issue about the governance and the scrutiny of the whole process and the leadership uh, of the school going forward. I, I would say with respect, and my colleagues might disagree with me, that it's not my impression that, that lessons weren't learned in relation to the proper scrutiny of building contracts and things that should be put in place. Uh, again, I, I await the investigation because I think there has been failure within those processes. Um, but I think 
my view, and, and Eileen's closer to it perhaps, or, or I have a closest through my daughter, was that things did improve after the first fire and this current contract was properly put in place, albeit it failed so catastrophically. But we don't know that. Yeah. The school has that. never commented on what lessons it may have learned. We don't have, and you don't seem to have, the evidence that supports that claim. Uh, so we, we, we have to treat that with a bit of scepticism, uh, that if they weren't transparent, if they weren't good with their governance and they weren't good with their scrutiny, then questions still remain unanswered in this whole process. And I think that's the crux of the matter here. I hope these issues would come out with the investigation, though I, I am concerned that, it's, that should it be too narrow, just based on uh, a, a fire report, when it should be looking... As, uh, as you're indicating, at uh, the whole responsibilities and processes behind decisions that were made. Thank Kenneth you. Gibson and then Ross Clear. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, uh, Convener. Following on from what Alexander Stewart has said, I mean, given what we already know and have heard this morning, I mean, I'll be a bit more direct than Al Alexander and ask if Glasgow Art School Board and Executive is actually fit to manage um, the reconstruction of the art school and its management going forward? Um, well, one can't predict whether they, are, whether they are fit. All you can do is look at what they have done in the last four years. And let's not forget that the art school was a building site because they allowed it to burn in 2014. Um, Stuart has already said that he has not been consulted, or well, the Macintosh Society has not been formally consulted, and there's a lot of expertise within the Macintosh Society about the current reconstruction, the reconstruction that disappeared in June this year. I have been involved in one committee which was arranged to discuss whether the chairs in the library should be like these, should be ergonomic chairs, or whether they should be Macintosh's chairs. Um, and that is the, the only input that I and other people with, with my range of expertise and knowledge have been involved with. The school and its architects have kept it under their own control. So we are unable to judge um, whether they are qualified to do it. I have heard from contractors that they have done things in a very different way uh, and that they were being uh, instructed to follow a pedantic system, uh, the system that their peers in 1900 would have used. And that's what Macintosh specified. Macintosh didn't specify how the school was built. He gave the, 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 the contractors a set of drawings as to how it was to look and how it was to be laid out. How they built it was entirely up to them to fit within their, their contractual uh, estimates. I mean, some people say Macintosh probably never made a site visit. I, I, I doubt that, but I've heard stories of special nails having to be bought from America because nobody makes the same kind of nails here to nail the library together. Nailing the library together um, is madness when you change the heating system to an underfloor heating system, which is the least uh, conducive to maintaining the status of a wooden interior. The library interior is wood, wooden floor, wooden walls, wooden ceiling, inside a brick box. You, you heat it in a way that protects it. And the architects chose to put in an underfloor heating system against the contractor's advice, or at least the contractor said, well, if you do that, you have to construct it in a different way. But they weren't allowed to. Okay, Mr. Roberts. You were talking about the rebuild and the, the school. I've, I've said on a couple of occasions that I would like to see a more sharing of knowledge, and I would like to see uh, if the rebuilds, uh, whether it's an expert panel or a trust put together, um, to, to drive it forward because I think it's a big project. I mean, the school's very much a teaching school. I think a lot of staff members have been um, doing dual roles over the period of time and uh, you can't predominantly then, then, then the school suffers on the education side. So I think there's an aspect there that you're, you're under a major conservation project and it has to be with an expert panel put together to drive that forward. 
I'll make a slightly different point. What has actually happened since 2014 is that the rebuilding of the library, which was a massive undertaking, um, and this next one you know, was even more so, of course, but it did detract from their core business. I know this is not the, the education committee, but <coughs> um, the, the 2014 um, rebuild of the library has diverted resources and attention and focus um, 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 of what they really are supposed to be there for. And whether they've got the expertise to do that, I don't know. And I wouldn't hold any particular individual responsible. But the board, you know, as a governing body, it's got the ultimate authority, key role in providing oversight. To deliver this remit, does the board in itself places huge responsibility and time, time commitment on non-executive members. But what about the GSE's ability to focus on its core business, its delivery of strategic priorities, key Scottish Funding Council outcome agreements, um, their international developments, um, recruitment, student experience. And as a matter of fact, the last two years, the GSE in the National Student Survey has been bottom in the entire United Kingdom, not just Scotland, the entire UK. Uh, last year, um, they said it was about displacement um, of students and problems around the 2014 fire. And I don't see how the current setup is fit for purpose with this massive rebuild and what's going to happen with the student experience. You know, how, how that should be their core business. So in my view, there should be some overarching... Um, very experienced um, board taken from experts across the country that's going to drive any rebuild forward and really let GSA get on with its core business with the oversight um, of the board. I mean, I don't know anything much about the board apart from the, the, the chair's you know, recent pronouncements, which don't seem to address any of this particularly. It's just about we're going to rebuild and that's that. Um, I think we need something a bit more thoroughgoing and they need to be creative in moving forward. They need a vision, they need to think about what they're going to do with that site, with that building and what they're going to do with their own students, find a permanent campus over the next 10 years and focus on their core business. That would be my view. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to move on, Ross, Creo. I haven't even had a supplementary at all, actually. I mean, I would, you know, um, in that, and others have a convener. I mean, I think there's a consensus that there's an expert panel, it seems to be, that should take this forward, and I think that's very productive. But I was going to ask, what kind of time scale are we looking at? Because, this, you know, you're talking about developing an expert vision, uh, uh, but um, how long is it going to actually take to get designs in place, to actually contract it, and to actually build it? We were already, it was four years from the last fire and the rebuilding hadn't taken place. So what kind of time scale are we actually talking about before we see the Macintosh um, you know, back to its uh, former glory, if possible? As not as an expert, I don't know, but I would say this to add to that timeline. There has to be a public consultation. There's a great deal of sentiment and emotion and hyperbole and you can understand that. Um, but that kind of uh, approach doesn't really sit well with a clear-sighted strategic vision um, for the future. So, you know, whatever board or panel, perhaps they could conduct this public... Co I know that they've said, you know, it's, it's, we've decided at a meeting it's non-negotiable, it's not up for discussion. I don't think that, that was maybe a rush statement um, because quite obviously there has to be... Um, um, proper consultation. So even that process and that process in itself is going to take a considerable amount of time until they decide what, what exactly they're going to do. And consultation. I mean, the local community there, uh, they have suffered more than than anybody else in all of this, and they need to be. You know, there has to be a much much broader discussion. So even before. The, the the board and, and, and the management get to the point where they're digging out plans. I mean, the way it was talked about last week as if it was, you know, everything's there, you know, it's like putting up Lego or something. It's really, really complicated, huge undertaking. And it, and um, 
and the, the local, the Granite Hill community, the businesses, it's been a shock to Glasgow. But I think this high octane emotional response that we've been getting from certain of the spokespeople from, from the art school, in particular the, the chair of the board, although it's understandable, we need to move away from that and, and have some real proper visionary creative thinking about the future. And that will take, that in itself will take a long time. As for the building of it, I couldn't say. I think there are also areas there where I see the school being a kind of catalyst and a master plan of partly a sort of regeneration of Sucky Hall Street mm -hmm. on the, the Sucky Hall Street side and whether that becomes a part of the campus or it becomes a design centre. But the whole, that part of Glasgow is needing a huge boost and I think there's a wider element of the, the Victorian architecture in the city and how you take that forward over the next 20 to 30 years because currently the, the city isn't really looking after its Victorian architecture and um, it lives off it. Uh, as it's been mentioned before, Macintosh is a, a big pool to bring people in from all around the world and but money's not been spent to support these buildings. Scotland Street School on the south side is a, a typical example. Martyrs. There's other buildings. The Hill House is undergoing restoration just now, which I'm sc slightly sceptical about. It's, um, again, on the security with no hu human being uh, in place. So there's a number of items that it needs to be as a master plan and how we drive that forward. And I think the city needs to... to and I think that, that's an area where we need cheering. We need to be more joined-up approach within the city. There's a lot of things going on in the city that there's no joined-up approach, and I think that has to change. Thank you. Ross. Thanks, Camille. Um, I'd like to go back to uh, the statement from the GSA that Annabelle Ewing brought up about the uh, site not being in their operational estate um, when the, the second fire occurred. In response to that statement, or I think the, the GSA had put out two statements in a row along those lines. In response to that, uh, Cure Construction <coughs> put out a statement saying that there was an agreed fire safety plan. But it wasn't clear when they were saying it was agreed, whether it was agreed internally within Kier as the site manager at the time, or whether it was agreed with the School of Art. Are any of you aware whether the fire safety plan was agreed between the School of Art and the construction company, or whether it was entirely down to the construction company themselves? have to have been submitted uh, even as part of their tender it will have to have been updated um, there are all sorts of sharing processes and oversights that are in place there and again clearly to me there has been either a failure in the plan or a failure in its execution and I want to, I, and I think that the key to this fire lies somewhere in there so I want to see this investigation telling us what's gone wrong with the plan and its execution and or its execution and how better statutory oversight can ensure that that doesn't happen again. If the GSA were involved in the development of the fire safety plan, as, as you're indicating, would have been the case through the contract. Is it unfair or even dishonest then for them to have attempted to distance themselves in the way that they did in those statements? Those statements are what prompted Care Construction to t put out their own statement saying there was an agreed safety plan. Well, the, the GSA appointed the project manager, it appointed a design team, um, it appointed a principal designer to take forward the construction design management plans. Um, all of them should have had the oversight of this plan. Again, without knowing the details of the plan, I don't know whether they have ticked off an inadequate plan or an adequate plan has gone forward and not been properly carried out uh, and the procedures on site that were agreed as being necessary were not carried out. This is what the investigation will tell us, but there clearly is enormous uh, uh, failure happened within the process, but I have not heard that there has not been the proper documents and oversight put in place for the contract. And looking ahead, if the site is reconstructed in, in one form or another um, and returned to the, the, owner, the ownership and the operational control uh, of the, the School of Art, what confidence can we have that this won't happen again? What would, what would we need to actually be confident that there won't be a third fire in the way that I don't think anyone thought after the first fire uh, that there would be a risk of a second one? Such immense destruction to something of such immense historical importance to Scotland. I think there was a perception amongst the public that steps would be put in place to make sure that didn't happen again. It did. 
what would we need to be confident that it wouldn't happen for a third time? It's nice that if you talk about the first fire and the second fire. Since the first fire, I mean, I've had a lot to do with artists who are trained or even students or staff at Glasgow School of Art. And the older ones tell me, well, there were fires every month. And they were put out by the staff and they tended to be caused mainly by people smoking uh, and uh, students and staff smoking in studios and they put them out. Now, the last, the 2014 fire was caused by somebody uh, contravening the regulations that the school set up itself and was apparently done with the complicit acceptance of a member of staff of the school. How do you legislate against that happening again? The school, the students today fill the school not with terps and, and oil paint and everything else, but with very expensive, very hot projectors, dozens of television and, and, and uh, computer monitors, cables strewn all over the building, linking these together. It is a fire trap. I mean, the, the firemen will tell you that most fires are electrical, unless someone falls asleep with a cigarette in bed. They, they, they happen because of an electrical fault. The school's product is driven by modern technology today. And, and so, yes, it will happen again. I mean, sadly, I mean, fires are, are no respecter of, 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 of what people don't want to happen. I suppose that if I rephrase it, then, rather than being about fire starting, and you make a very fair point, fires will happen. Um, it's about, and I think you, you'd used the phrase before about compartmentalising, it's about preventing fires from spreading, that the design of any reconstruction would have to put huge emphasis on ensuring that if any incident did occur, it could be compartmentalised and contained. Well, I would hope that any, any designer in, involved in it would, would be fully aware of that. And of course, the school gets, gets away is the wrong word. Because it's an A-star listed building, Building control does not have the oversight of it that it would normally have. Uh, and, and things are allowed to happen because of its status. If you're building it from scratch, you can build all of these things into it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green. Thank you, convener. Um, it seems to me that uh, there are two questions that somebody needs to answer and it's quite unclear as to who will answer the, these questions and make decisions but what should be rebuilt uh, are we looking at a like for like replica as the phrase has been used to restore it to its former glory or should it be uh, notwithstanding the shell of the building but what's inside it some sort of interpretation of, of, of what it was and secondly what should it be then used for once it has been rebuilt and a number of suggestions are coming forward. And if you ask 10 people, you'll get probably 10 different answers on this question. Everything from a museum, but then how do you build a new building that replicates an old building authentically, an exhibition space that rightfully gives uh, artists a, a space, uh, a working school. By then, it, there will have been over 12, perhaps more years will have passed without it being a school. Uh, and given that the JC has 14 other buildings to use, should it be used for a school? Or, uh, as others have alluded to, more of a community space, given the massive upheaval that, that has it caused to the surrounding area. What do you think Charles Rennie McIntosh would want to happen next? Uh, how do you second guess that? Um, most architects, sorry, Mark, are, are probably faced in the same position, would say, yes, rebuild it, or yes, let me have another go at it. But giving it to somebody else to have a go at is not going to answer the question because you don't know what you're going to get. And we have seen, uh, not too far away from the art school, what you get if you leave an architect uh, with, with, with carte blanche. Um, the art school is not a difficult building to build. And... Partly going back to the earlier question, we will talk more about it in terms of time, how it should be built, who should build it, where, when it should be done, than it will take in years to actually put it up. It's two towers, a central tower, and a great big empty space in between it, which was full of studios. And it's all computerised. In theory, one could press a button 
and Malcolm knows much more about this than I do, but in theory, you could the information we have got could allow the drawings to be produced, say, within three months, and then you need to find a contractor. The site could be cleared. Uh, it would be very quick to put up, but there will be a lot of talking about it. I think it should be rebuilt as it was because it's a, it's a work of art, and, and unlike a, a, the Mona Lisa, which is hand-touched by the artist, and nobody can replicate that, um, what you see of the art school is the work of a hundred tradesmen who built it, but what you also see is the concept of the designer. Now, that concept remains, uh, and there is no reason why it can't be replicated. Um, but it needs to be done. I mean, there are other examples. We talked about Upwork and Windsor Castle. Yeah. Nobody knows the difference in those places. There are things that you shouldn't do, and you could say that the interior of the house of an art lover is something that you shouldn't do, but fortunately, um, there are no uh, artistic areas, should we call it, within the art school that need interpretation. It's a very simple building, I think, to put up. Difficult site, but but what Macintosh put on it, apart from the, the complications of the West Elevation and the library, is a relatively simple, perfect answer to the brief. Well, I think I think the building's too important to, to disappear. I think it's uh, uh, as a as a, a a masterpiece of a building. It is my classed as Macintosh's masterpiece. It, it shows you everything he was trying to do. Uh, I think, I can't remember if it was 2010 when they did an audit or prior to 2010 they did an audit at the campus and it was the only building fit for purpose of the campus, which says a lot about the 1960s buildings and such that went up. Um, I think you're at that, that cusp of uh, coming into modernism where Macintosh uh, and, is the importance of it culturally. I mean, you wouldn't build student flats on top of Edinburgh Castle if it burnt down. So I think... Um, um, that the Macintosh building is such, and it is such an appeal to come in. It is one of the big attractions for people to coming to the art school. It, it's world class. It's, it's viewed around the world as world class, and I think sometimes we don't appreciate what we have in this country. And it should have world heritage site. It should have had it a number of years ago. Uh, we we did a, a learning journey to, to Chicago and a learning journey to Barcelona to see what they were doing, and we said, well, why is why is Macintosh not World heritage within our own city, and I think that's something that the city should work for for the future because uh, I think it's very beneficial. But to, for it to disappear would be a tragedy, and it would show that Scotland doesn't care about culture. We have more information on this building than any building in Scotland. A huge number of its fixtures and fittings are in storage off site. So they, the return to site would not be facsimile, facsimile, they will be authentic. There was parts of the library that were ready to go in or off site to. It is reconstructable, but the, we would have to be, should we, the, the purpose of reconstructing it is that reconstructed, it's a great working building. And I go back to where I started. This is not a work of art, as in you look at, you stand away from. It was a good working building, it was tough. It took a kicking, it had been used and abused, and could continue to be used and abused in its rebuilt form for the purpose it was originally built. Part of its beauty is it's so unusual for a historic building that still works perfectly for its function. That gives it more importance. It's a building of transcendent importance in architectural history. We must get it back, not do something different, make certain decisions about the heating system, do all these sorts of things, which I think the architects were struggling with quite well and should continue to struggle with, but we should rebuild it. And again, and these are the two critical questions. Um, it, it worked, and its beauty was it worked for students, it informed them, it sent out good students into the world. It was a creative place. It was a hard-working place. Um, it's been terrible what's happened, but... It needs to be what Macintosh designed it for, still working in the 21st century, and that's a glorious thing. That's a thing to celebrate, and uh, we need us and the school to focus on how to get back there, learning the lessons along the way. Uh, the legacy of the Macintosh should be that fewer historic buildings burn in the future, that there is better oversight, that we care for them more, um, that we give them the importance they deserve, 
even down to things like that. You know, if you repair a building, you pay 20%. If you knock it down at zero, build a new one at zero. It's that sort of ridiculous thing that we labour under uh, as architects who care about historic buildings. So I would like to think we can get back to having students in there in a wonderful working building that's a living work of art, not a dead reliquary work of art um, that spins out lessons for how we care for other such buildings in future. Can I say, I, I would agree in principle that that, you know, in an ideal world, one should do that. But Macintosh build, met, designed that building with Fra Newbury, the director of the school, for X number of students. It's now got three X number of students in it. It's overcrowded. Uh, they cannot work in the ideal situation that Macintosh intended for them. And the vast majority of them do not need the facilities that he provided. And just as a brief follow-up, because I know we're short on time, is who, who should be consulted on next steps and who should make the final decision? Who owns the building? Does the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government own the building? And I, I propose that it become a different kind of building and the art school should move its students somewhere else. And I'm aware that I did not propose who should pay for the art school to, to find a building to, 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 to house its students somewhere else. But... There are so many stakeholders in it. I mean, Stuart could, could probably list you um, a, a dozen off the top of his head. All of those people who gave money for 35 million, or they didn't quite give that much, for the, for the reconstruction, have a, have a voice in, 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 in what should happen in the future. Now, the art school has said nobody wants their money back, but they, didn't, they were careful not to ask them if they'd give them the money again because I know from some of the charities who gave money that it, that's going to be a no-no. Um, so there are hundreds of people, not just in Glasgow, but around the world, who could have a valid input into how the school should be rebuilt. We're going to go slightly over time. We've got one more member of the committee, and we have the constituency member for the art school here, uh, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. I found this session to be very interesting. Um, and so the first question is, uh, do you think any public money should go into the rebuilding uh, if that is the case, um, if, the, if a, a version 3 takes place? Well, the insurers say that they will fund it. I mean, we don't know what the sums... 100 million has been suggested, but we don't know how much the building was insured for. They would presumably, on any insurance policy be either a like-for-like -like clause or uh, a cap. Um, and, and if the, the function of the building changes and the art school has to be compensated for the loss of accommodation for its students, then presumably that is a, a, is a public cost. I think there's another thing as well. I know when it's a, uh, buildings going under uh, construction, usually the insurance is split between the construction company and the, the school um, on that process. That happened when we did work in 2006 at Queen's Cross. So uh, I don't know what, again, what the insurance company was on the construction side as well. Okay. Ms Reid, Mr Fraser. Um, there will be considerable public money spent anyway, indirectly. Um, and if the job is done properly this time, um, for however long it takes, then it will be certainly the case that in, when I say indirect um, public funding, I, what I mean is not here is 50 million. There will be, if it's done properly, there will need to be a very, there will be a change in infrastructure, you know, the whole kind of inf managerial infrastructure in order to accommodate. I mean, it was bad enough just rebuilding a library. And despite what Roger says, and I'm no expert, so it, but it doesn't make sense to me why it would go up so quickly if it took so long just to, to, to put the library in, at the top spent, of the building together. spent two years uh, doing research and such. Right, into, yeah. So there was an awful lot of investigation in that period of time. And again, doing the forensics and investigation. And an awful lot more was learned about the building and Macintosh through the first fire. So there was a lot of valuable yeah, exactly. information. Yeah. So they, that was all carefully done before yeah. they started doing the work. And it's still yeah. available. And it's still available. All that information is there, the 3D, all the added information, because the building had changed over decades. Uh, each decade, there have been subtle changes. So the fire stripped some of these things back on the first fire. So there was a massive amount of information that was learnt about the original building. Okay. Um, 
I don't know. There's, I don't know. I think it depends on what decisions are made about the use of the building in the future. And I really, really believe, and somebody raised it, it this that needs to go out, it needs to be full consultation, there needs to be a proper discussion about that. And I think once that decision has arrived at, then we, c then we can look at it. So for example, somebody was saying to me the other day, the displacement from the MAC building was possibly only about 20% maximum, I, I'm not sure, I would need to check with the art school, of displacement from the Macintosh building elsewhere. And um, and that needs to be, you know, that's something that has to be taken into consideration. My own personal, and this is an emotional response, when it was, when it burnt down this time, I just felt it's gone. It's lost. It's gone. And I know my colleagues here won't, you know, agree with a sentiment at all, I suppose. And it and it almost feels too soon, you know. It's it's gone. What are we going to do? It's a bit like you know when the Buddhas were big, blown up in Afghanistan or whatever. You felt this re great wrench, but sometimes something has just gone. And I've now come around to the view that yeah, it definitely has to be rebuilt. But whether it's rebuilt immediately, as fast as possible, in order to accommodate a ra relatively small percentage of students. Well, they just take some time over this. If the, the guys are right, and I've got, of course they are, we, we do have Out the plans. Time, so we, we do have the plans. It doesn't need to be built now. You know, the next generation can build it. Okay. I, I, I wouldn't want to go round in circles, examining our entrails, tearing each other apart for blame. It needs to be rebuilt. Uh, it needs to be rebuilt for students. I think we should go ahead and do that. I would regret if talk of public money going into it got the insurers off the hook. I would like to see leadership from the Glasgow School of Art in talking about insurance and finance and what it will take and what timescales are and what they think should happen in it. And as I say, I would like that to be about students and about how students share the experience of that wonderful building. So I would like to invite leadership for them from them in terms of looking at the finances of it and talking about uses of it and talking about a programme for getting getting it back. I want to see that building crowning Garnet Hill again, um, full of creativity and students as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Um, we're joined today by the constituency member for Glasgow School of Arts, Sandra White, MSP. Before um, you ask your question, Sandra, can I ask you if you have any relevant um, interest to declare to the committee? Um, no, no right. any relevant okay. interest. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm coming from it in two issues. Obviously, the fantastic, iconic building. Uh, I would, I say it's tragic, but I think it's criminal. It's happened twice, and, and I want that on record. But also, as, as Irene had mentioned, the community itself, they really can't afford to wait another 12, 15 years to get their lives back on track. Now, if I could just touch on the 2014 fire, have lessons been learned? I think I've heard what you've said. As far as I'm concerned, no lessons have been learned from that fire. The report was redacted, but my understanding is it was a student. There was a projector running for three hours. A member of staff tried to put it out, but actually blew it up the shaft. So the questions that I wanted to ask, and I don't know if you want to answer it, but perhaps the committee could look at this. Why was the cover of the shaft off? Why was no fire retardant material inside the shaft? And why was the report redacted? And another one I wanted to mention, I think, for information, uh, it's been brought up by a number of members in regard to key construction and obviously the Glasgow School of Art. Now, I've had a number of meetings with the board, but the only person I've ever met with is Tom Inns. I haven't been able to meet with the chief of the board, Muriel Gray. I haven't met with her at all. And when I ask these questions, as has been asked by Annabelle Ewing, surely you would check on what was happening. They told me they had a project team and they reported to the board every month. Now, I would hope that the committee perhaps would write to the Glasgow School of Art to see if they can get these minutes. Because as far as I know, nobody around here realises there is a project team. That's what I was told by Tom Inns in regards to that. And the other issue I want to ask is, do you think the board is fit for purpose? Uh, you know, Should it remain in its present form? Or should the, the, the iconic building, not just the School of Art, but the iconic building, yeah, be under World Heritage site, 
but also be taken under public control and out of the hands of the board. Because I think from what I've seen, lack of transparency, no communication with the local community at all in regards to what's happening in the area, I don't think they're fit for purpose. So if I'm able to throw that out, Chair, is that be all right with quick answers or I'll leave it to the, yeah. to the committee? Does anyone want to very quickly answer those points? You answered your own question. Yeah. You, you have <laughs> itemised exactly what is wrong with the School of Arts handling the 2014 fire and going forward until this summer's fire. I'm, they probably had absolutely nothing to do. I mean, the, the, the most common reason being put forward for the fire now is a piece of old wiring at the top of the east elevation of the school sparking and setting fire to the roof. Photographs of the fire show it starting in the roof and spreading from east to west and then falling onto the O2 building. My understanding is it fell into the, the O2 building, the ABC. Yes. So surely if you're talking about you know, basically who's culpable... Uh, and these other well, that, places. That's again the, that's, that's, it, these questions have got to be answered. Well, by the contractors the, the board. can't can't design scaffolding against the possibility of a catastrophic fire. I mean, if you did that, all, co all contracts I would think would be unviable. I mean, Malcolm will know how that will affect costs. Security going about, surely they should have seen it. Well, yes, but sprinklers Sorry. sprinklers were in the school in 2014, mm. but they were not connected up. Because the, 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 the sprinkler firm encountered asbestos, asbestos which should have been removed by the architects and their contractors between 28 and 2012. Now, that's why I say the, re the fire department report should be shown in its unredacted form so that we know who is responsible. for Because we're going to continue employing them. It's not a blame game. I'm not saying they should go to prison, but we're going to continue employing them. The same architects who were employed to do the 2008 refurbishment of the school were, re were employed to restore the burnt school in 2016 or whenever it was. And the staff are still there who were responsible for it. I don't want to send them to prison, but I would like to make sure that they don't operate in a system where they could do it again. Absolutely. Thank you. Did anyone else want to quickly come in? Very quickly. Um, this relates to the Garnet Hill community as well. One of the astonishing things was the fire alarm didn't go off that night. And this so-called gold-plated security, whether it was agreed or not agreed, um, seemed to comprise of three security guards in total. So there was only one on at any you know, given time and he was located in a port cabin and supposed to sort of you spot this visually. You know, there's all sorts of, you know, the community have been saying, we didn't hear any fire alarms, and you're thinking, well, no, I don't know where the responsibility lies for all of that, but I'd, I, I, think, I, think the, I think the board management not being fit for purpose is really because it's beyond their capacity and their infrastructural capacity, rather than maybe personal failings. And this is where the discussion needs to go about some other... Overarching board. The community has suffered more from Glasgow District Council's building control department than it has from the art school. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence. Oh, so very quickly, Malcolm Fraser. Yes, that the, the, the committee um, inquire uh, about the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service investigation to uh, establish its terms of reference and ensure that it does get to examine contracts, responsibilities, adequacy, and on-site uh, uh, on -site compliance. Very helpful advice. I'd like to thank you all for coming to give evidence today. And we shall be having a follow-up session um, and inviting management from the Glasgow School of Art. Um, and we'll be putting some of these issues to them, I'm sure. Uh, thank you very much. And we now uh, close the meeting and move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>